Hey, let me speak with you today about grace today. And we're doing it on Palm Sunday. We're talking about the day of the triumphal entry of Jesus. When we say Palm Sunday, we're talking about that day. But we're really celebrating the most important week in history from the most important person who ever lived and died and lived again and rose from the grave. That's why we call it that Resurrection Sunday. Now, in this final message of Grace Today series, I have been using the backdrop only mostly from the book of Hebrews because it's the book of Hebrews that tells us from beginning to end what grace really means. In fact, today, I want to read to you a verse, chapter 2, verse 9, that is really the commentary of what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane just right before he was arrested during this most important week. But the, the good news is we're on this side of it, and we can hear the Hebrew writer said this way, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels and human form. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man and woman, for everyone in the whole world. What do you mean, Pastor, that even Jesus had to have help from heaven? Not in his divinity. He said, and a moment's notice, I could call for ten legions of angels and remove the devil off the face of the planet, but you would be lost forever. So he submitted in his humanness, submitted himself to the cross, and the Bible says, by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I ask you to speak to us. Help us, oh God. It's a living word. We believe you for it. We thank you for it. We ask you to speak powerfully and cause us, oh God, to help us to understand what you're saying to us in this moment, in our day, to grace this day. In Jesus' name. It was C.S. Lewis, great, ph phenomenal mind. If you read anything from C.S. Lewis or heard his story, you'll know a man who was just an incredible writer and author, but in the middle of a lot of uh, educational a hierarchy of people, they would say to him, what's the, what's the big deal about Christianity? What's the big deal about the church uh, compared to all the religions of the world or any other institution? What's the difference? What's, what's the difference about? He said, that's easy. It's easy. Grace. Grace. You don't really understand what the difference is between Christianity and and the rest of the world until you get a grasp of grace. Often we experience what we don't even understand. Aren't you thankful for by grace you are saved? For by grace you got God's help even to lift your voice to say, Jesus, save me. For by grace you are saved through faith. It is not a gift from us. It is a gift from God. Lest any man would boast and brag about it and say, I did that, you know. Or you could listen to the humanist manifesto who says, we don't need a God to save us. We can save ourselves. How's that working for you? <laughs> Just ask her. Just ask her. All my life, I'm thankful, especially in school. When the teacher got up and said, I'm going to have to grade this exam on the curve. I went, thank God. <laughs> I wanted to be in every class that my wife was in because she was the valedictorian by the time we, I mean, from the seventh grade on, I knew that woman going to take me places. Well, she did. And, and, and I thought, man, oh, man, because when she got the hundred, the rest of us who got 80 and below, at least go get 20 more points, you know? And I was going to have, the, my grade was going to be on the curve. I always loved that moment. Can I tell you, all my life, I have lived under the absolute gift of knowing everything God's ever done through my life, everything that I've ever been able to recover from, every accomplishment ever in my life, I've lived on a grace curve. I mean to tell you, I've, all my life I have done and have 
been and experienced things I should have never, ever been able to do. But God lifted me up and blessed my life. And he gave me honey in the rock of my life. In every hard place, I found the sweetness in the hard place. And he brought me through. And I always looked better than I should have looked. Sounded better than I sound. Better looking and uh, today than I should for, 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 for my size and for... I'm a little swollen, but I mean for the most part. I want you to know, I've been living on the grace curve. Woo! Yes, I have. I, I was in a room, and I didn't, I shouldn't have belonged to the room. I was the youngest in the room. It was a, 15 men were in this room, and I had been elected to something that I hadn't even had a single position as the assistant steward. Walked in the room, found my way to the end of the table. Men came in, laughed at me, said, you don't even know where you are. How did you get here? And who in the world let you in the room? And sent me to the head of the table, shook their head. Their children's children was the same age of my babies. So I'm the young one in the room with all the grandfathers, and they're all shaking their head. And I said, I know. Can you believe? I I don't know how I got here either. <laughs> if you'll holler out for grace, if you'll lift your voice and say, help, I tell you, if you lift your voice, Jesus will find you in a tree. If you're on the side of the road with your blanket and nobody else cares, Jesus will hear your voice as, you wa- as he walks by. Listen, here is the secret sauce of life. God responds to those who call on his name through his son's name and humbles himself and say, Lord, I can't do this. That's why I want to call this message today, how to move from I can't to get up, let's go. I want to name this message today for you. I can't. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you said, I can't do this? I can't bear this. I can't handle this. I can't face this. I can't walk in this. I can't can't go through this. Have you ever had a moment? If you haven't, hang on. If Jesus tarries, there might be one moment in your life coming. But a lot of us in this room have either coming through one right now, coming to one right now, or in our past can tell you, I've had those moments. Have you ever heard this? Except for the grace of God, I don't know where I would be. Can anybody in the room say to me, except for the grace of God, I don't know where I would be. I'm telling you, I would have ruined my life except for the grace of God and His mercy to us. That's why when I read Matthew 26, And I see Jesus moving to the cross. It says this. He went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. Gethsemane was the place where olive trees harvest the olives, take him to a huge rock where another big rock would crush those olives. And that oil would run down like a funnel down through. And they would harvest that oil. And there would be three uses for them. That's a message for a wonderful another day. But all of that, at the place of crushing olives, think about the setting of it all. Jesus is there. He brings his disciples. He says, I want you to sit here with me. And I'm going to go over there and pray. And he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John. And listen, don't read it too quickly. He become anguished and distressed. I'm telling you. That day when you didn't know it was like just any other day and the news hit you. I remember just walking out of a wonderful morning of golf, showering, and the phone ringing and telling me, your, Judy, my sister, had been in a major car wreck. Didn't know if she's going to make it. I'm telling you, the moment when life shifts and there is, there is distress and anguish in his life in this moment. What did Jesus say? He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. In other words, he's inviting them to pray with him. He went a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from ye, me. I can't. Please, Jesus. Jesus is saying, father, let it pass from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. There's the difference in the moment of I can't, Lord, help me, move me. I can't, move me to I can. I can't do this, move me to I can do this. 
Move me to that moment. And it says from that moment on, he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, could you even watch just one hour with me? Can you feel the pain, feel the, 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 the grief in his soul? Keep watch and pray. Say you'll not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing. Now here's the difference. Our bodies are weak. Our minds are weak. Our lives are weak. It is in our weakness. You either struggle to pray or struggle to live. You either struggle to keep faithful to God to get the grace to live, or you struggle to make it from one thing after another. I chose my struggle. I either give my griefs and my weaknesses and my I can'ts to God and help him to help me, raise me up and bring me up a day or at a time, or I back away and I say, oh, I'll do my best. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, most people ain't wearing boots anyway. They are a self-made man. Don't, don't, that's not a compliment if anybody ever says you're a self. No, we are a God-dependent person. We are God-dependent. And it says this, then Jesus left them a second time. My father, if this cup cannot be taken away when I drink, unless I drink it, your will be done. Now he moved from, Father, let this cup, I'm asking you, let this cup be taken from me, but not my will, your will. Father, if it can't be taken from me, your will be done. See him moving. What's happening on, in this moment? When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. You ever been that way? Couldn't keep your eyes open. I helped start a church in, in, in the north part of Jacksonville, they told me. Hilliard, Florida, uh, 10 miles from the border of Georgia. We started a church there, and, and uh, we had a Friday night prayer meeting every Friday night. And I was a college kid between my junior, uh, sophomore and junior years, and, and, and I'm, I'm up there, and he says to me, the pastor I'm working with, he says, now look, let the people sign up on Wednesday to come pray with us. We're going to have all night prayer meeting every night from 6 in the evening to 6 in the morning every Friday night. He says now, and me and you are going to take what nobody, how, if they don't sign up, me and you are going to take the places where people don't sign up. How many knows that people don't sign up from 1 to 6 in the morning? So he would, he'd say to me, okay, you got 1 to 6. I'll be here from 6 to midnight, but you got 1 to 6. Like he was doing me a favor. And I'm like, oh, okay, yay. And I would pray for a little while, and then I'd lay before the Lord. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have no alarm or no nothing. I'd wake up in severe conviction and guilt. I don't think it was conviction. I think it was just pure condemnation of the devil. But at the time, and I'd have to go confess every Saturday. And, and by the way, he thought I should learn how to play a guitar. So guess when he bought me, he bought me guitar lessons? 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. After I've been up all night, coach, what are you supposed to do? Try, you want me to run cows, things, etc. I, I mean, what are you going to put me? And he sent me to the Claude P. Gaines Conservative School of Music who thought Bill Gaither was a heretic. <laughs> but I'm falling asleep every Friday night. I'm not hard on those disciples. Y'all don't, y'all be careful. Don't pick on them. Why? Because our flesh is weak. Man, the earlier that you learn... In this flesh dwells no good thing. And the earlier that you learn that you can, my heart is deceptively wicked, and, and who can know it? I don't hardly know it myself. I give my heart over to God every, why? Because I don't even know. The earlier you learn your own limitations and your weaknesses, the quicker you'll bring yourself to Jesus every day. Every day. And so he went and prayed a third time, saying the same things. And again, he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep. He's going, can't you, what, can, can, can you even wake up for an hour? Can y'all please pray with me? Go ahead and sleep. It's okay. What happened in that time frame? Jesus went from, I can't drink this, to, okay, let's get up. Let's go. Read it right here. Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is portrayed in the hands of sinners. And verse 46, one of the greatest absolute faith words in all the Bible. Okay, up. Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. I'm telling you, 
God can help us in the worst day of I can't by the power of his own son. It's why after he tells us in Galatians 2, he says, come boldly to a throne of grace. He tells us in Ephesians 4, so you can understand. After he says, look at Jesus, then he says, how about you? Come to that throne of grace that you might obtain mercy. Thank God mercy was new again this morning. You woke up, you woke up with a fresh batch of mercy on your life again today. I'm not talking about what people think about you. you know, people, nah, forget about that. You, God gives you fresh mercy today and they won't give you mercy till they need mercy for themselves and, and, and but, God, but you find mercy and he said you you get mercy and it says this and find obtain what find grace and so coming to God is finding grace and the Hebrews the whole book is about uh, the, the ability not to miss the grace of God on your life he gets five exhortations. I've done the first three. Let me do it quickly remind you of them. The first one, he says, be careful of drifting. When you're drifting, when you're drifting, you're missing out. He says, be careful. Be more careful. Attention. When you're drifting, when you begin to neglect the things of God, when you get away from a worship, when you get away from the Word of God, when you get away from calling on His name, when you start getting away from, see, I, I find that people live on the grace that they're first exposed to, and then when they need more grace, they get more grace and they come. But as they do, when you are neglecting the measure of grace that God has given you, and it start, you're starting to drift. And drifting leads to doubting. Doubting is very, it's just, it's very subtle, but it becomes, just a little drifting becomes unfaithful to the Word and to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, I thought I heard him say that, and, and I thought, and it says, don't harden your hearts in the day, just like they did in the, in the day of rebellion in, the, in Egypt. He said, because drifting leads to doubting, and doubting leads to dullness. Dullness means you lose the edge of conviction, you lose the edge, something can't reach you, you can sit in the middle of a, of, 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 of a, a music or a powerful word of God, and it not move you, not touch you. you. I mean, a child can walk up to you and say something, and and, and, and nothing moves you. You are moving to a place of dullness and the sharpness of life and the sharpness of the Word of God and the sharpness, listen, to the very core of our being. We need to make sure we stay tender before God and the things of God and we're listening for His voice and His presence in everything and we want to not see how far can I get away from God and still be saved. We want how close to God can I get in this lifetime? How possibly close can I get? I and the question is, how far is too far? Well, if you've got to ask that question, you're already drifting because you just want to, how, well, can I do and still be saved? No, I thank God I can be saved and that I don't have to do that because I get to do this and I move toward him and I don't move away. When that moment of dullness begins to hit, you've got to run to Jesus as fast as possible. He said, has it not been made this? He said, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer are trying to understand. It's a moment when you've lost your attention. And you say, oh God, here's the encouragement from Hebrews. He says in chapter 6, verse 18, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. And God has promised you and not only has he promised you, he's given you the down payment called the Holy Spirit from his own voice. When you go get something, buy something, and you go, I promise I'll pay for that. Well, watch your collateral. What, what, what's your, what, what are you going to back up your word with? Well, my property, my house. What does God back up his word with? His own self. God says, I will back it up. It's impossible for me to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. It's that moment of weariness. It's the moment. It's a dangerous moment when dullness sets in. Shake yourself. Shake yourself and run to Jesus. The Hebrew writer continues. He comes to chapter 10 and he goes, hey. Listen, there's a danger here that doubting is leading you to despise. You're, you're despising the things of God. You have doubt to the place where now you are despising those who love God, go to church. Has there ever been anybody 
that you've ever known. Thank you, my brother. That's kind of you. Did you drink out of it? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, it's from my daughter. My daughter sent you up with this. Hun, are you, are you good? You sure? I sure hope you are. Now, if I don't get to go to Sweden, you, my, your mother, you're going to answer to your mother. You know that? She read, she read her dad, and she said, my dad's struggling on his voice. And so we all have known him. We've all known people who you would say, they must be living at the foot of the cross. I mean, go to church, pray, say, raise your hand, speak in tongues, and then we hear, what? What are they doing? And we go, how could they? I'm showing you how could they. They began to drift, and it was silent. It was in secret. Then they began to doubt. Man, look all I've done for God. What, what have I got in return? They begin to, to get dark and, and I'm not moved. Feeling pretty good about, you know, nothing moves me. I ain't cried in a long time. Oh, it's kind of dangerous. And suddenly, that's fast. A man said to me once, Do you think God can forgive something as awful as I'm about to do? He's challenging me. He knows I was a man of grace and. Do you think God can forgive something as awful as I'm about to do? And I said to him, let me, let me think about that moment. I said, I, I don't think it's a matter of whether God will forgive. When you sin, it changes your heart. And I'm not so sure you're going to want to be forgiven. And that's the danger. The very ones, I mean, I've seen people turn. On their friends, on people of God. Say, well, they're narrow-minded and judgmental, and I haven't got room. One man said, and I'm not going to let a book tell me how to live. Guess what? Somebody somewhere in some book is telling them how to live. And so what happened? It was that moment when they drifted so far, little by little, they stepped over a moment into rebellion. You understand that repentance is the doorway to grace. Repentance is the doorway. Can, can I give you something? The Bible says it's the kindness of God that led you to repent. And when you repent, there's grace come up on your life. I did that five years ago. Can I do it again? How about joining me? I do it every day. Because I mean, I mean, I done drove down the road a few times. I'm going to have to repent again. And, and I, I done been dealing with some stuff. And repentance is a gift. But repentance, what? Repentance begins in the house of God. And we understand it's our Oh, God, help us to be able to understand every day we go back up. Repent means to go back up. We call it the penthouse. They put it on the top. Well, we keep going back up, and we get going back up to God, and repentance and turns. I'm telling you, when you feel a tinge of rebellion in your heart, go back to Jesus. Run back to him as fast as you can. Say, oh, God, I ask him, will you even want God's forgiveness after rebellion has entered your life? And that's the danger. Oh, God. People all the time say, well, you know, backslidden, you think God will forgive? Listen, God will always forgive. I'm telling you, well, what about the sin against the Holy Spirit? Another for another day. Let me say it this one thing. If you and the are ignoring the voice of the Holy Spirit over and over and over again and he is not able to, re to, to reach you and you are closing your heart, what kind of greater sin would there be than to not listen to the voice of God and listen to the Holy Spirit and you speak defiantly about that? That's a whole other matter that says yes because why? You have shut the door on your own. But if you'd open the door, there is one knocking. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. I knock, I knock on all the heart. Aren't you thankful? You and I in this room who have had moments of recovery where we came out of our own rebellion. I mean, we found ourselves down a path. We thought, well, how in the world? I don't even recognize myself. And you turned back and ran through that door and you found the grace of God back on your life and you walked in there with strength and said, oh God, this is what repentance looks like. It looks like this door. And you ran through that door and grace comes on your life. 
Here's what the encouragement from the writer says. Don't throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's what will. Then you'll receive all that he has promised. People get weary. We get weary. Listen, up to before COVID, you know, you, we didn't know what the church real was about. But man, when that thing happened, one third walked away. I mean, from everything, walked away. Not just uh, out of the building, out away from God. And some have walked away from God. Why? Because in that moment, there become a, a, a challenging moment where they said, I'm not going to be a part or do this. And where is the reward? And where is the promise? I'm telling you, God will never, ever ever be one that you will say that didn't keep his promise to you. He will always honor his word. He will honor his promise. And he will honor exactly what he says to you. And finally, number five, and I'm moving really quickly because what? Define leads to define. It's the final warning, warning of Hebrews. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If the day did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth about Mount Sinai, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? The final warning is, hey, listen, you're, you're despising the things of God led to define. You've had the grace of God to get you here today. You that are worshiping online, do you realize the grace of God is operating in your life right now? You're looking, when you look on, God's grace is operating on all, because you're in this room today. Now, my encouragement to you is don't be drifting while you're in the room. Don't be, uh, shake yourself if you've gotten dull to the things of God. You gotta, why? Because you can be in the house and the process done started. And so you, you shake yourself and say, oh, God, help me. Why? Why shake myself? Because if you'll shake yourself, God won't have to. Chapter 12 of, of Hebrews says, since we're receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. I was a child when I first heard a verse. Might have been Sunday school. But then I heard that verse begin to be shortened in my teenage years and a little bit later on. I'd hear people say, you know, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. I thought, oh, I, I guess that's how you say that. I can do all things. I can do all things in Christ. And all of a sudden, I thought, what? And so I thought, what was people... Yeah, people bought into the first part, I can do all things. But they forgot the second part of the verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I can't do very much. I can't. I know who I am. I, I'm thankful. Thursday, I mean, it's a bucket list moment for me. I got to be at the Masters on Thursday. Walk nine miles and I'm still on my feet, glory to God. I, I, I watch those guys hit that ball out of sight and all those things. I know my limitations. I know why I was on one side of the rope and they were on the other side of the rope. But I got news. For, I went to the Masters. It took me a long time to get there. And I walked away with a green jacket. Okay? So I got my green jacket. And you golfers will know what I meant by right there. But I want to tell you something. Even in that, in that moment like this, I'm watching those, and I'm watching those struggling with their limitations and all the things that are going on. And, and with that moment, I think for that, for that moment in my life when I'm looking at something that I once used to do that I can't do that the way they can to do that, and I know my limitations. See, you need to quickly say, God, I know what I can't do. You're asking me to do what I can't do. I don't want to be nice. Okay, Lord, I can't be nice. Okay. Come on. Now you look at me like you, you know, don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all had to be nice when y'all won't be nice. Is it just me? I can't, I can't, I can't bear this pain. I can't walk through this moment. That's exactly right. Confess that to Jesus and be able to know that he will move you to, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And God will give you help. He'll move you all the way through. The book of Hebrews ends like this. Grace be with you all. Amen. Y'all didn't know the writer of Hebrews was Southern, did y'all? 
Grace be with you all. Hey, he ends Hebrews. Paul ends Romans. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. That is not there by accident. He wrote the whole thing to say, Now, having said this, may the grace of God be on your life. Yeah, there's moments. It says, I can't. What am I read about from the Boston Globe? It's a, about a, a young woman's response to what happened to her. Um, ten years before this moment in June, she lived on the streets. She was homeless, uh, just barely alive. But she got help and got a job, some education, got raised up, got a little, little nest egg, attracted a young man, and ten years later, she couldn't believe that she's going to be married. And so they went and, uh, to the Hyatt Hotel, her and her fiancé. Hyatt Hotel. It's one of the grand places of Boston. And they, they, they chose the china and the silver and the flowers and just, I mean, went all out on a $13,000 reception. Went and chose those announcements. And on the day the announcements arrived to everyone else, he said, I can't do this. And he had cold feet and he left her. So she goes down to the Hyatt Hotel and says to the woman, hey, um, you're not going to be getting married. Embarrassed, shame, humiliated. And the woman just kind of threw her head back and laughed and said, honey, I, I understand. That same thing happened to me. Well, I'd like to get my money back. And she said, um, I'm sorry. The contract says we gave you that date. Everything's in order. You only get $1,300 back. You, you, or she just jokingly said, or you can throw a party. And she thought about that for a moment. And the Boston Globe newspaper tells about a story about a woman who used to live on the streets who decided to turn around her moment. She said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. She went to every nursing home and every homeless shelter in the area, went to those in the streets, and on a warm night in June in Boston, they rolled out the red carpet. She kept the white linen. She kept all the, the, the silver. And, and the newspaper says the only thing that was, she said, the hostess that she became changed the menu to boneless chicken in honor of the groom. I'm just reading what the newspaper said. Just reading. I want to read this to you. That night, oh, my, my. People who were used to peeling half gnawed pizza off the cardboard dined on chicken cordon bleu. Hyatt waiters in tuxedos served orders to senior citizens propped up by crutches and aluminum walkers. Bag ladies, vagrants, and addicts took one night off from the hard life from the sidewalks instead, sipped on fine uh, wine and ate chocolate wedding cake and danced to big band melodies late into the night. And I said, when I read, I said, that's what Jesus has done to me. He's invited me to his party and allowed me to come out of the hard life and experience his grace. And that moment, she turned it around and made it. That's what grace will do. It'll turn around your moment and move God in such a way that it will bring great strength. Stand with me this morning.